Hello guys, I am Sajad Pathan and welcome to another video for the FR Chem final single best answer questions. Today we are going to look at the practical procedure questionnaires which the college has put up in the regulations. Uh, the practical procedures are 13 questions which will be asked in your final FR Chem single best answers and the regulations says that you need to know about adult sedation pediatric sedation, pericardiocentesis, non-invasive ventilation, escarotomy and lumbar puncture. So today we will look at some questions related to these practical procedure scenarios. So without wasting further time, let us look at question number one. The question states, you prepare for a reduction of dislocated hip in your ED. Your colleague is ready to manipulate the plan is to achieve moderate or conscious sedation which statement holds true according to the ASA guidance the use of capnography is mandatory ECG recording is essential should be performed in recess area or acute area with monitoring available minimum four team members are involved level one sedation training and current ALS ILS is essential First, we need to understand the terminology called conscious sedation. It's kind of odd. Somebody cannot be conscious as well as sedated. But what we mean is moderate sedation, that the patient can be able to respond when, when you talk to them. Uh, I would put it, it this way, that the patient gives you the counter traction. OK, uh, so which statement in this scenario is true? So, uh, use of capnography is mandatory, ECG recording is essential. These are the two things which I am thinking of. What do you think? Let us take a pause of 10 seconds and then we will look at the answer. Okay, let us rule out the stuff. I feel the first two are correct should be performed in recess area or acute area with monitoring available that is false because it should be done where the resuscitation equipments are available not necessarily only monitoring minimum three members are needed one to do the procedure one for sedation and one for uh, helping you out with the procedure or monitoring purposes uh, local sign of level one is recommended not mandatory or essential let us look at the first two options the use of capnography is mandatory this is a conscious sedation in this the asa guidance says is recommended not mandatory ecg recording is mandatory so the answer two is correct if you look at this chart i'm sorry if it's too small I'm going to put a link of this chart in the discussion below. You can go over and read it. What essential things are required with the depth of sedation. Let us look at question number two now. Post reduction of a shoulder using sedation. You were asked by the nurse in charge to expedite discharge of a patient as the department has literally no space to see new patients. However, the patient is still complaining of a sore shoulder with some discomfort despite a check x-ray shows successful reduction. His observations are stable and he is conscious and coherent fully. What would you consider now? Let us look at the options over here. I am going to give you 10 seconds. Think about the answers and then we will discuss the answers. This question is actually discussing about the discharge criteria post sedation. So post sedation we all know that he should be to his baseline in terms of observations and consciousness level should be accompanied by along a responsible adult. One thing essential is the pain and discomfort should not be present. So the correct answer in this scenario is you give him per oral paracetamol and codeine and ask him to wait for reassessment 
in level 2 area level 2 area is your high dependency unit or recovery area or your recess area itself let us now look at question number 3 you are contemplating suturing a large wound on a frightened 4 year old boy the nurse and the ED colleague has suggested to suture using sedation you plan to suture using ketamine okay ketamine is a good dissociative agent but can be safely used in which of the following cases a child with active urti a child with known cognitive or motor delay a case of pulmonary hypertension doing a procedure that would last about 15 minutes but should not be more than 20 minutes child with previous known psychotic illness i give you 10 seconds again this Think about the answer, then we'll look at the options. So what is the speed of action of ketamine? It's about one minute and the duration of action of ketamine is about 10 to 20 minutes. The time to discharge about 90 minutes. So this is an average. This is what is given in the RKM guidelines. So here in, in this question, the answer would be doing a procedure that would last about 15 minutes to less than 20 minutes. Remaining everything is a contraindication. You can look at this chart where the college has given the contraindications to use of ketamine. I'm going to put a link of this document below for you to review later. Let us look at question number four now. 13 year old boy had a difficult right shoulder reduction in the emergency department using ketamine sedation. 20 minutes past procedure, he is seen agitated and seeing things in the room that are not present. So he is delirious. He seems to be sweating and getting restless regarding this event. What is not recommended? So again, a 10 second pause. Then we will look at the options. So here the options are treating with a small dose of midazolam prophylactically. Before we discuss the options, what is this phenomenon which is happening and which is commonly seen in the adolescent and adults rather than pediatric children, small children. So this is the emergence phenomena. Emergence phenomena and laryngospasm. Think of these two as one of the main side effects of using ketamine. Other ones are vomiting and uh, raise blood pressure etc etc so think of emergence phenomena theoretically yes in literature there is evidence that treating patients with ketamine sedation with a prophylactic dose of midazolam does help but the college at mo at the moment does not agree with the fact and says that please do not use midazolam prophylactically so that is the right answer over here okay let us look at the question number five. While performing an RSI, you are a standby airway colleague. After laryngoscopy, your colleague verbalizes that it's Comac Lahani grade two airway and successfully places a bougie and then a tube. What is Cormac Lahani grade two anatomy? So the options are very clear. This is a simple question. This is your bread and butter. You should not get it wrong. Let's take a 10 second pause and then I will directly tell you the answer. Yes, the answer is two. If you got this one correct, pat your back. Let us look at question number six. 54 year old lady with known history of metastatic breast cancer is in the emergency department with shortness of breath. On assessment, her blood pressure is 85 systolic, heart rate is 106 per minute, saturations of 92% on 15 liters and her JVP is raised. While evaluating for a cause, you obtained a bedside echo and see an echoic shadow around the myocardium based on the findings. What would be a false assumption? A triad of raised JVP, hypotension and muffled heart sounds appears briefly before cardiac arrest. This is your Beck's triad. Electrical alternance on ECG is highly sensitive. Pulseless electrical activity is typically seen in cardiac arrest. 
dyspnea and tachypnea are common presenting symptoms diastolic collapse of right heart chambers are diagnostic so again a 10 second pause and then we will look at the answer This case describes a classical presentation of a pericardial effusion, oblique pericardial tamponade because she is hypotensive and unstable. So the Beck triad appears briefly before cardiac arrest. That is a true answer. That's a true assumption. That's not a false thing because Beck triad is not always seen completely. If Beck triad is present, the patient in the next few minutes will have a cardiac arrest. So that is correct. Electrical alternance on ECG is highly sensitive. Mm, no, it is not. It is specific, but not sensitive. Pulseless electrical activity is typically seen in cardiac arrest. Correct. Dyspnea and tachypnea are common. This is correct. Diastolic collapse of right heart are diagnostic. So this is correct. So the answer in this scenario is question uh, option number two. Let us now look at question seven. You have seen a patient in your department with dyspnea and unstable observation. ECG shows low voltage complexes and the bedside echo confirms pericardial effusion. You plan to do an emergency pericardiosynthesis. What would be an acceptable indication to perform the procedure? Pericardial effusion and stable vital signs, traumatic pericardial effusion and unstable vital signs or cardiac arrest, myocardial rupture, aortic dissection with a tamponade, tamponade in a peri arrest patient with bleeding disorder. A 10 second pause and then we will look at the answer. So the scenario over here describes an unstable patient with pericardial effusion. So that's tamponade. So tamponade with pericardial uh, pe present over here. The options over given are which would be acceptable so here this becomes a tricky question because you need to select single best i know for sure many people would have thought traumatic pericardial effusion and unstable vital signs or cardiac arrest traumatic pericardial effusion or traumatic tamponade needs to be dealt with a uh, open thoracotomy you would be wasting precious time doing aspiration of a pericardial effusion so do not do that that's not recommended the indication over here is Option number five, tamponade in a peri arrest patient with bleeding disorder. Because if you don't do this, they will have an arrest. You can correct the bleeding disorder simultaneously, but this is very important. Some people will argue aortic dissection with a tamponade. Well, aortic dissection with a tamponade is a contraindication. However, if aortic dissection happens with the arrest, you can do it. Myocardial rupture is a contraindication and stable observations are contraindications. Let us now look at question number eight. A 64 year old male with an extensive cardiac history is in the emergency department with shortness of breath and pink froth from his mouth. His neck veins are distended, liver is palpable, you hear crackles widely as a diagnosis of pulmonary edema is made, you initiate treatment of CPAP. A couple of hours later, you see a great deal of clinical improvement. Wow. What is not a mechanism that CPAP deploys to improve this condition? Recruitment of alveoli, splinting of alveoli, reduction in the work of breathing, reduction of preload and afterload, driving fluid back into circulation from the alveoli. Take a 10 second pause and think of the answer and then we'll look at the answer. So CPAP has been effective in congestive heart failure with pulmonary edema. How it functions is you need to understand the physiology. It does recruit the alveoli, it splints the alveoli, keeps it open. It reduces the work of breathing. It also reduces your preload and afterload. And these are the four mechanisms through which the CPAP helps in pulmonary edema. The fifth one is a wrong concept, driving fluid back into circulation from the alveoli. 
this may not be, this is not true because the patient will show a clinical improvement however at that point of time if you take a chest x-ray you will still see the fluid shadow so the fluid doesn't move out it's just the splinting and reduction of work of breathing uh, reduction of preload after load those are the mechanisms you can go to clara oliver Banerjee's book revision for the frkm intermediate book over there they have discussed this very nicely and very sweetly let's look at question number nine again the question belongs to the niv category 65 year old smoker is in the emergency department with shortness of breath and cough you notice he's diffusely wheezy and is saturating at 82 percent on two liters of oxygen he was discharged three months ago with a diagnosis of acute on chronic obstructive lung disease you have initiated bronchodilators done a chest x-ray evidence suggests bipap ventilation and copd should be beneficial in all scenarios except pH 7.25 to 7.35 that is correct pH CO2 greater than 6 kilopascals that is correct full medical management oxygen nebulized salbutamol epratropium steroids antibiotics is done with little or no improvement comatose patient due to COPD induced hypercapnia no medical improvement despite full medical treatment including magnesium take a 10 second pause I have ruled out two options you can you just need to rule out another two We'll look at the answer soon. So the criteria for use of NIV in a COPD is that the patient is having a pH of 7.25 to 7.35. Evidence does not show that it benefits with a pH less than 7.25. pHCO2 greater than 6. Complete medical management, which includes your bronchodilators, antibiotics if necessary, and steroids. There is no role of magnesium in COPD. Yes, magnesium does play a role in asthmatics, but not in COPD. You will tell me the main contraindication of use of NIV is a patient who is not conscious or a patient who has altered mental status but this is one exception to the rule if the patient is having low gcs due to hypercapnia that's a reversible cause you can actually use and there is evidence to show for it so comatose patient due to copd induced hypercapnia is an indication so the last option is the answer in this scenario let us now look at question number 10 64 year old patient is in the department of a district general hospital with circumferential full torso burns there were many other casualties in the incident and it took about two hours to get him to the emergency department the paramedics have given a liter of hartman's iv morphine and have covered his wounds he looks unwell and is intubated immediately however the ventilator keeps alarming as high pressures are needed to ventilate the patient is sedated and paralyzed you would want to release his chest burns to assist in his breathing what should you consider now let us look at the options take 10 second pause and select your answer so let us look at the options speak to the itu consultant and general surgeons to assist in escarotomy likely true at st3 level st4 level not at a consultant level use lignocaine as topical anesthetic at unburned skin area while marking while making incision discuss the indication of procedure and transfer to a burns unit if feasible prior to the procedure this this is for st3 plus or maybe people who are not trained in doing escarotomy but the college requires that st6 level or st5 level you should know escarotomy discuss with regional burn center making lateral incisions on both sides of the chest and transfer fasciotomy may be more useful fasciotomy is used in compartment syndrome here there is a circumferential burn and that's why the ventilator is bleeping my choice over here is discuss with the regional burn center make the incision and transfer this patient let us look at question number 11 you're about to do a lumbar puncture on a meningitic lady the f2 assisting you would like to learn more about the procedure what considerations are most likely to be helpful doing the procedure in sitting position using ultrasound to mark your needle entry point hydrating the patient pre and post procedure will reduce the incidence of headache L2, L3 puncture is more successful than L3, L4 and L4, L5. The needle is kept parallel to the floor and perpendicular to the patient. Take your 10 seconds and we will discuss the answer.
So basically they are trying to ask us what would be most helpful in doing a lumbar puncture. Doing a procedure in sitting position is more difficult than in lying position. Using ultrasound, absolutely, this is the answer. Use the ultrasound and mark the point of entry. You will also know how far you have to go with your needle. This is the answer. Hydrating the patient pre and post doesn't help. L2, L3 is more difficult than L3, L4, L4, L5. Needle is kept parallel to the floor and perpendicular to the patient. No, it's not kept perpendicular to the patient. Yes, it is kept parallel to the floor. However, the needle is slightly angulated towards the umbilicus. So let us now look at question number 12. 54 year old lady is in the emergency department with severe headache which has been persistent since she was discharged two days ago by the medical team following an admission to rule out subarachnoid hemorrhage. She had a normal CT which was followed up by lumbar puncture two days ago. What intervention would have been unfruitful to prevent this complication? That means it's useless to do. Procedure done in lying position than sitting. Use of pencil tip point needle than a cutting edge needle. Use of a smaller gauge needle. Placing the bevel parallel to the long axis of spinal fibers. Prolonged bed rest following the procedure. Take your 10 seconds then we'll look at the right answer. Okay, so we have clearly mentioned what would be useful, what would not be useful, we have to identify from these options. So as I said, procedure in lying position is better than sitting. Using a pencil tip point needle is better than cutting edge needle. There is evidence for that. Use of smaller gauge needle is much better than a larger gauge. Placing the bevel parallel to the long axis of spinal fibers is correct. Prolonged bed rest following procedure is irrelevant. There is no evidence behind it. This question has been made from up to date. You can go log in on up to date and read about lumbar puncture. That's all for now in terms of practical procedure. In my next video, we will look at critical appraisal and quality improvement projects. And in the subsequent video, we will look at leading the ship. Good luck with your exams. Good luck with your studies. Happy reading. Happy studies. Stay safe. Stay blessed. Peace.